Right, so just clicking through, there's a few more things on this. Um, so this is a training on mechanical ventilation, particularly around the, the McKay Servo U, which is the device that we, we use here at Leeds. Um, we do have occasionally the VG70 machines, and actually the modes are named very similar, if not the same, and the screens do look similar. Things are in the same sort of place as, as they are on the McKay, but they um, just look slightly more basic, I suppose, compared to the McKay. Um, so the aims of the session are to help you understand and become more familiar with different modes of ventilation. So we're going to talk through some of the principles of why we would ventilate patients, um, as well as the different modes that we would use. Um, become more familiar with the interface of the McKay Servo U and in altering settings and alter, you know, pressing buttons on the machine. So it might not be altering settings so much, but particularly things like putting the machine into standby so that you can swap between the McKay and the Coffices, for example. Um, at the end, we will just discuss some alternative ventilation strategies. So first of all, some of the indicators of mechanical ventilation. Um, we can split these into physiological and clinical indications. So the physiological reasons mean that Mechanical ventilation allows us to support or manipulate pulmonary gas exchange. So that might be changing settings on the ventilator. Um, one example might be that if we were to increase the respiratory rate, we allow that patient to, um, they, we could make them hyperventilate, for example, and blow off more CO2. So that's one sort of basic way we can use the ventilation to um, manipulate the gas exchange. We can change lots of other settings that would, would also do that. And as we talk about the different modes, um, that should become clearer. We can use the ventilation to increase lung volumes. So it might be by um, increasing pressures or we might be using um, volume control ve ventilation, but either way we, we can improve the lung volumes that the patient is achieving. Um, we can reduce work of breathing. So, Initially, we would sedate the patient. We may even paralyze them. So their work of breathing is going to be um, completely, if not or largely removed from the patient. And the, the ventilator will do most of the work, if not all of the work. So that's obviously going to reduce their work of breathing and, and unload their ventilatory muscles. So lots of this can sort of allow us to give that patient time to correct the sort of initial problem. Some of the um, clinical indications are the, linked to the things that we would see with the patient. So some of the signs and symptoms of whatever their primary problem is. So if they're hypoxemic, we can use mechanical ventilation to reverse hypoxemia. So thinking about those physiological indications, supporting and mitigating pulmonary gas exchange or increasing lung volumes um, it could reverse hypoxemia. We could reverse acute respiratory acidosis, um, relieving respiratory distress. So if somebody's work of breathing is very high um, by using mechanical ventilation, we can reduce that distress by um, taking some of that work from them. Um, we might use it to prevent or reverse atelectasis, um, linking to lung volumes again. Um, reverse ventilatory fatigue. So patient who's perhaps got respiratory muscle weakness or um, another problem called you know, increasing their work of breathing. It's only so long that they can maintain that work of breathing and they become more tired. So we can sort of reduce their, um, their sort of workload by um, sort of taking that off them and that will reduce their fatigue. We can reduce um, systemic or myocardial oxygen consumption. So um, in somebody who perhaps is septic or multi-organ failure, where um, the sort of energy and oxygen consumption um, to help them recover is very high, that um, then unable to meet those requirements, then mechanical ventilation can be used for that. Um, it might allow us to um, reduce intracranial pressure so by controlling parameters and, and also by um, having that patient sedated. And um, in some patients, we might need to stabilize the chest wall so that we can 
adequately ventilate or, and allow lung expansion. So that could be um, trauma patients, for example, or um, patients where um, the, their sort of mechanics of, of breathing um, is altered and we need to sort of take control of that. There are some negative effects of uh, mechanical ventilation though. So, um, so I'm just letting people in. Um, the first one is VQ mismatch. So we make quite a big change to how that patient ventilates when we mechanically ventilate them. When we're spontaneously breathing, we're drawing air into dependent lung, region, lung areas and we're breathing through changes in negative pressure. Typically when we ventilate somebody, we're using positive pressures. Um, we might control the volumes, but the, the pressures being delivered are positive pressures. So that reverses um, uh, that um, sort of method of, of gas exchange. So we reverse that gradient because the, the diaphragm is then passive. We're pushing air in, which is going to push down on the diaphragm. And that gas being blown in through positive pressure will just take the line of least resistance. So it will ventilate upper regions where the alveoli are more open more easily than moving to the spaces which um, have more capacity to expand so in the bases so in an upright patient the upper regions of the chest are going to be ventilated more easily there isn't necessarily the the correct perfusion match there so that's where we get this vq mismatch um so we have to be aware of that when we're thinking about positioning patients and what we're trying to achieve when we're um, using positioning as part of our treatment. We also increase the dead space that that um, patient has to overcome when they're breathing because we're adding a lot of tubing. Um, uh, that's essentially like an extension of their um, the bronchi bronchioles. Um, so that's going to make things harder for them. The surfactant that's normally produced is um, not um, not able to work in the same way. So um, the compliance of the lungs is affected, um, and particularly with longer term ventilation, that can be become a problem. And we bypass or reduce the effectiveness of our normal mucosillary clearance. So uh, by having a, an artificial airway in place, um, the mucosillary clearance that we would normally get is, isn't able to work as if effectively and that may just be that we've completely bypassed it. Um, so secretion clearance can become a problem. And then particularly over time, if we're taking that work of breathing away from the patient, the muscles um, uh, are less active and in, in some cases not active at all for periods of time, so become weak. Um, and then we, we end up where we're needing to wean those patients from ventilation um, in order to remove the support. Um, a brief bit about sort of the principles of our positive pressure and how we might manipulate some, some of the pressures. So this, this graph we've um, pinched from one of our um, BiPAP um, presentations, but the um, principles are the same and some of the terminology it's useful to sort of look at and see that we use um, slightly different terminology for essentially the, the same uh, thing. Um, so in our normal breathing, we've got that fluctuation of, um, of pressure over time with each breath. Um, when we add some PEEP or CPAP, um, then or EPAP, if you're thinking about non-invasive ventilation, then we're shifting that pressure higher. So we're, we're moving away from the closing volumes, those alveoli. So those alveoli are splinted open and the, the work of breathing is, um, is much less for the patient. They've not got to overcome that initial pressure each time they take a breath, but you've just got that, that fluctuation. Um, at the same volume as the normal breath just moved slightly higher in the in the pressure um, axis. If we add another level of pressure, we've still moved them away from those clo closing volumes by adding an EPAP or a, a pressure, um, sorry, an EPAP or a PEEP. Um, uh, so that's, that's in effect your CPAP, but then we, in our inspiratory phase of the breath, we're taking that higher into the pressure um, curve there, or, pressure axis so 
by adding IPAP, so an inspiratory positive airway pressure, that could be pressure control or it could be pressure support. So we've got, um, we're, we're actually increasing the tidal volumes um, more effectively by, by adding that extra pressure. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I'll let you carry on on that one. Yes, I yeah. Sorry, we were just switching over our um, microphones. So I'm going to sort of try to put a lot of the stuff that um, Lorne has touched on already about sort of ventilation in general and just try and link it now to the stuff that we might see in practice. So um, if you can just move to the next slide. Um, we're going to focus mainly around the, the MAC A, so the, the ventilator that we see on ICU. And I'm going to sort of talk through hopefully a few of the different modes um, and what you might see with the different modes, where they might be used, um, and a little bit just about how to use the ventilator in general. So this is the, the Survey U MAC A, which most people, if you've worked sort of on ICU or out of hours, will be familiar with. Um, this is the standby page. So as you can see, this site comes on. Um, the first arrow is pointing to sort of the type of ventilation. So this, the MAC is really, really clever and it, it pretty much does everything. So we need to tell it, first of all, what we're actually wanting. So we can have invasive, non-invasive. Um, and then the second arrow is pointing to the ventilation mode, which again, we can go into that and change. We've got um, the button on the right hand side, which is to start whatever you've set the, the ventilation type and the mode to, or you can equally start it in the top left hand corner as well. Um, if you flick on, I keep trying to do it and I'm not got control of it. So we'll run through sort of what, what, what different modes you can choose from. So choose from. So in the ventilation section, you've got sort of three subcategories really of different modes. So the first one you've got is control. And this is where the ventilator controls the ventilations, but with boundaries set by us or by the practitioner. Um, and with the control mode, the breaths are mandatory. And actually the, the ventilator is not expecting the patient to do any of the triggering of the breath. So this is probably going to be patients that are sort of fully sedated and we're not expecting them to, to spontaneously breathe. We're not wanting to wean them at all. We're just essentially controlling their ventilation, controlling their gas exchange by manipulating the, the pressures um, to, suit, to suit what we want really in terms of the gas exchange. We've then got the interactive modes, which as you can see on the screen, there are quite a few of those ones. Um, and these are the sort of middleman modes, I call them. So we've got um, some of the auto modes where it shifts automatically between a controlled mode, which is sort of what we've just talked about, um, and, a, and a supported mode. So it allows the patient to sort of, as they're waking up or maybe as they're weaning off sedation, spot, do some spontaneous breath supported by the ventilator. But equally, if they don't breathe, the ventilator is more than happy to kick in and deliver them a, a mandatory breath. Um, and then you sort of move on to your support modes, which in theory, your patient should be spontaneously breathing on a support mode. And actually the vent is just literally supporting it. So what it says on the tin, um, it's just going to be giving them pressures to support their breathing, but they're going to be manipulating their own respiratory rate. Um, however, there is the backup um, system in place with the support mode in case they do apnea and we need to the, the vent needs to kick in and breathe for them. And this is probably the one that you're gonna see most patients on um, sort of when they're in that quite steady weaning phase, um, maybe with a track in or maybe when they are sort of waking up and prior to being extubated. So making sure that we're happy that the spawn breathing themselves. I keep trying to click again. <laughs> so we're just gonna focus in now on the, the control modes. So we're not going to talk about all of them because there are loads of them. Um, but the ones we'll probably see the most are the ones that I've sort of pointed to with the arrows. So pressure control. So as it says on the tin again, this is a constant pressure delivered over a preset inspiratory time at a preset respiratory rate. Um, and actually 
the volume is changeable on this one because we're not setting the volume and it'll change in relation to the lung and thoracic resistance and compliance dependent with the pressure delivered so all we're setting on this one is the pressure and like i say the, the volume is variable different to that is the volume control so this is where we're setting a preset tidal volume or minute volume and we are um yeah, preset tidal volume over a preset inspiratory time and the respiratory rate, um, and it will deliver that set pre that preset tidal volume regardless of lung compliance or resistance. So it will deliver the pressure that is required to reach that set tidal volume. So say for example, we've set it as five hundred. The vent that's the vent's job, and it will deliver that regardless of what it needs to give from a pressure point of view, um, because that's what we've set it to do, um, and. Again, the, well, the patient can trigger breaths on this. It's not expecting it to because it's a controlled mode, but they are sophisticated enough that if the patient does trigger a breath, it will sort of try to incorporate that into, um, into it as well and sort of sync with it. And then probably the one that we'll see most is the sort of pressure regulated volume control, which is a little bit of best of both worlds of the, of the two modes that we've just talked about. Um, so yeah, it combi combines the advantages of the volume control and the pressure control by delivering the preset tidal volume. So we're getting a guaranteed tidal volume, for example, of 500 mils um, with the decelerating inspiratory flow at a, reset, a set preset respiratory rate. But what it does do is it tries to maintain the lowest possible constant pressure throughout inspiration. So yes, it wants to achieve 500 mil, but it will just try to keep the sort of the, the inspiratory pressure at the lowest possible in order to achieve the tidal volume. Um, the inspiratory pressure of the breath will never exceed five centimeters below the upper pressure limit. So you can change the pressure limit. Um, and again, it will allow the patient to trigger extra breaths, but the control mode isn't expecting the patient to breathe. It will just do it for them. Um, so sort of moving on to the interactive modes. So we've got some SIMV modes within interactive, and then we've also got the auto mode. So if we start with the SIMV modes, SIMV stands for synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So in the SIMV modes, mandatory controlled ventilation breaths are delivered. So again, the ventilator is delivering the mandatory breaths um, at a set rate but the patient can breathe spontaneously um, and, it, and it's the sort of key is in the name. It tries to synchronize with the patient. So if they do breathe for themselves, it will let them and it will almost try to synchronize with them. Um, so the ones that sort of the, the SIMV modes that you might see are pressure control, pressure control, then um, pressure regulated volume control or volume control. And I think the next slide do we talk about prvc yeah and probably the main one that you're gonna see um which i would say most of sort of most ventilated patients at lthg certainly over this side of the city and probably i think at jimmy's a little bit as well are on prvc i think because it's quite a nice mode where it like i say it does incorporate pressure control and ventilator um, volume control and also is that synchronized situation where it's sophisticated enough to allow the patient to breathe if they want. It's sort of, the, I think, the combination of a lot of the best of a lot of the modes. So just to sort of orientate you to the screen, we have got the um, set parameters or the set values, should I say, along the bottom. So you can see that we've got the oxygen concentration. So currently set to 50 on this particular one. We've got a set PEEP. So like we said, it's pressure regulated. Um, so we've got a set PEEP. We've got a set SIMV rate. So currently that's set to a, a rate of 15 and a set tidal volume. So what will happen is this mode will deliver um, a tidal volume for every breath a minute, for 15 breaths a minute, and it will achieve 350 mil and the way it will do that is by delivering a peep of 10 to the patient and then delivering an inspiratory pressure on top of the peep of 10 to whatever the, the ventilator needs to to do to achieve 350 and that will largely depend on the patient's lung compliance um, and and often we can sort of 
to tell what's happening by the, the right hand column. So this is sort of what's happening live. So we can see in the top left, we've got the, the peak pressure, which is currently 24. So for example, um, well, this patient's actually breathing. So that's probably not, um, that's probably not helpful, but often you can sort of tell a patient's lung compliance a little bit or sort of how hard the ventilator is having to work to get to the, the set tidal volume by looking at the peak pressure. So let's, for example, say that that says 20. I know it says 24. Um, if this patient was, was getting the mandatory breaths of 15 breaths a minute for five, 350 mil, and there was a set peak of 10, if the peak pressure was 20, then we could probably assume that the ventilator is going to have having to give another 10 of, of, of inspiratory pressure on top of the peak in order to achieve 350, which is a reasonable amount of inspiratory pressure. Whereas often if that peak pressure is really high or it's sort of climbing into the mid thirties, you know, you might be thinking, why is that? Is that because the patient's got lots and lots of secretions or they're really bronchospastic and the vent's having to work really, really hard to achieve the, the set tidal volume. And it's sort of having to sort of push through quite tight or quite um, restricted airways. Um, so that's always a good thing to look at. You've got your respiratory rate, which might be the same as your, your set rate if the ventilator is doing all the breaths or you might find that it's a different rate and one thing just to, to sort of watch out for is at the very top there the little lungs flashing up so on a mode like this where it could be um, mandatory breaths or it could be spontaneous breaths one of the ways to figure out if your patient is doing any of the breathing is literally to watch to see whether the little lungs are flashing up here um, because the respiratory rate might actually be the same if they are just genuinely breathing 15 breaths a minute, um, they might be doing all of those 15 breaths and just watching the, just need to watch the little lungs flashing up. We've got the tidal volume below that, which again, if the patient doesn't breathe on this mode, then we're going to be getting that tidal volume that's there. Or obviously, if they are breathing because they're sort of starting to wake up, this mode is trying to synchronize with them. What will happen is the lungs will flash up we'll be giving them the peep of 10. But what happens when they do spontaneously breathe as well is that this one comes into play. So the pressure support above the peep, just on the left, on the right at the bottom, and it almost sort of turns into a bit of a BiPAP at that point. So when they spontaneously breathe, it gives them 10 of peep, but then it's also gonna give them the pressure support. Um, and then the tidal volume will then be determined by whatever that makes and whatever, whatever their lung compliance allows. So the tidal volume might be different. Um, the one below that, the C dime, however you say that, that's something to do with lung compliance. That's not something we're massively looking at. I think, did we decide that a low number? Yeah, I, I don't really know. A low number is better. And it's, I think some of the some of the sort of anaesthetic consultants things are looking at it in terms of the lung compliance. Yeah, lung compliance, dynamic lung compliance, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. The other one probably that's a little bit more important to us is the tidal volume to, to body to body weight. So the mils per kilo. So tidal volume is going to be very different from one person to another. Um, so it's not largely dependent on a patient's weight. It's sort of dependent on um, a specific calculation that's worked out on an ideal body weight for a patient, which if the details are put in correctly on the ventilator, so if their gender, their height and their weight is put in, it'll do a calculation to formulate their ideal body weight. And essentially this number really for a patient should be in mils per kilo, about six, six to eight, six to 10 mils per kilo um, to be getting the right tidal volume for them. So just because you weigh 100 stone, 100 stone, 100 kilos, <laughs> hope you don't weigh 100 stone, just because you weigh 100 kilos doesn't mean to say you'll have a larger tidal volume than someone who weighs 65 kilos, um, it just means that potentially you're a bigger weight because you've got um, excess body tissue or body fat or whatever, so it is largely dependent on a ideal body weight, so you want to make sure that the tidal volume that the patient's getting is sufficient for them and like I say we want to weigh in for sort of six to ten um and anything below six is something that you might have heard of in terms of um an alternate way of ventilating someone if we're thinking about protective lung ventilation which Lorna will touch on a little bit later so things like um, patients like your ARDS patients for example um so just watching that number can often give you information about are actually they achieving 
tidy volumes that are appropriate for them. Um, move on. So that's sort of the FI and V modes. Um, auto mode is something that you might well have seen as well. And we do often use the auto modes. And this is the one where the ventilator shifts automatically between that controlled and the supported ventilation. And it sort of is just quite a smooth transition. Um, so when the patient's making a bre the breathing effort, the, the ventilator will switch to the supported mode. And if the patient isn't making any breathing effort, the ventilator will return to the controlled mode, controlled mo mode of ventilation. So it switches really easily. There are a few different ones. So there's pressure control to pressure support, um, there's vol pressure regulated volume control to volume support, volume control to vol volume support. They're all a bit of a much and muchness. Probably the one, what, the one that you're going to see most, mostly is going to be the auto mode pressure control to pressure support CPAP. So this is often used when patients sort of waking up, maybe from um, like on sedation holds and they're starting to breathe a bit more spontaneously. Maybe they're doing a bit too much breathing to sort of sync with the, the SIMV mode. Um, so what will happen is, as we can see in the, the sort of top left, um, whichever mode they're currently ventilating in will be sort of highlighted in white. I mean, they're, they're very similar, but at the moment it's highlighted in the pressure control. Um, again, I've sort of put a box in the top right hand corner. That is where your lungs would flash up again if you if you were to see the patient spontaneously breathing. Um, and then similar to the other modes, your parameters or your your, um, your settings that you've set are at the bottom. So 21% oxygen, PEEP of five, um, and uh, then we've got a respiratory rate, which the respiratory rate on this will be a respiratory rate that will kick in and deliver that, that rate of breath to the patient if the patient doesn't breathe. A pressure control and a pressure support. So a little bit confusing, but the, the pressure support, they're both inspiratory pressures. They're just called slightly different things. And the pressure support is when the patient's triggering the breath. And then the pressure control kicks in when the ventilator is delivering the breath. So really they probably should be set to something very very similar um that's right isn't it yeah they're normally o often often they'd be very yeah the same you want them to be the same i think perhaps if a pressure support has been weaned then you might want them breathing the other one hasn't other, been the other yeah one hasn't, then that's maybe when you see it yeah so um it's worth just checking that they're the same yeah, yeah. um Sometimes what you might find is if the respiratory rate is set to 15, for example, here, the ventilator is expecting the patient to take 15 breaths a minute. If the patient dips below that, then this the auto mode will then swap to the pressure control mode and, and it will deliver the breath for them or it will give them the breath. So sometimes what we do find is that if we turn the respiratory rate down on this, it will almost just allow the patient to have more time to trigger their own breath, certainly if they've got a, a low respiratory rate or they're just starting to breathe a bit more for themselves. Um, and then we sort of move on to the just the supported mode. So again, one that you'll have probably seen or come across, so pressure support CPAP, which essentially is just BiPAP. So we're thinking about two pressures, the patient is spontaneously breathing for themselves, um, and we're delivering a PEEP and a pressure support. So like Lorna was saying, a PEEP. So taking them to that um, higher level of pressures for them to breathe on top of and sort of reduce um, how much work they're having to do. And then we're giving them the inspiratory pressure. So again, we're using that same terminology as, as before, the pressure support, um, which is above the PEEP. Again, it, it's not going to leave them high and dry if they don't breathe. There is a backup rate. So as you can see there, it's set to 15. But again, it, it, we can probably turn that down a little bit um, as, a, as a real backup in case they don't breathe. So this is a mode where your patient might be awake, they might be alert, they might have a tracheostomy, um, and we're almost just essentially supporting their breathing to keep on top of their gas exchange or rest their respiratory muscles whilst we're weaning and we're waking up. Or often sort of it's the last mode a patient might be on before we extubate to sort of truly see that they can spontaneously breathe by themselves. Um, so again, for this one, the patient's going to be controlling their own tidal volume and controlling their own respiratory rate. We're essentially just giving them those pressures to support them. Um, 
that's basically it. As we said, the MAC A is pretty, pretty good and it, it can do most sort of modes of um, and types of ventilation and oxygen therapy. So aside from sort of the ventilated modes, we also can do non-invasive through the MAC A. So when we say non-invasive ventilation, obviously it's that umbrella term for sort of CPAP and BiPAP. Um, we do often interchangeably call BiPAP NIV, um, which is a little bit naughty of us because in theory it is just an umbrella term for sort of anything delivered non-invasively. Um, a bit of a blurry picture, but this is a picture of the screen on the non-invasive mode. So to get to this, we, we sort of would go back to thinking about that first standby um, sort of screen of the, of the Mac A. Um, and instead of clicking on the little head that says invasive, we, we just click on that and click non-invasive and it would bring this up. So the mode that we're mostly going to be using is this um, NIV, NIV pressure support. Um, which essentially is going to be giving us the option to give the patient um, a peep and an inspiratory pressure. And again, the MAC A calls it pressure support. Um, so if we turn the pressure support to zero, we're going to be giving the patient CPAP, aren't we? Because it's just going to be peep. But equally, if we turn the pressure support on, we're going to give, be giving them BiPAP. Um, and the MAC A screen is really good because we've got lots of really useful information on the screen. So we've got peak pressure, um, we've got respiratory rate, we've got minute volume, tidal volume, and we've also got a leakage as well. So you can often, the percentage in the bottom right-hand corner, you can sort of often tell, um, you know, for example, if it's alarming or they're not, they're not achieving um, good tidal volumes, then often it's because there's, there's too big of a leak. Although the MAC is quite good and it will compensate for a reasonable amount of leak, um, but that's always a good one to look at. Um, sometimes we will see this screen for patients who've got tracheostomies in. Often if we are at the point in their um, weaning where we're doing the cuff, taking their cuff down on the trachea and popping the passive valve in, so the one-way valve. Um, and the reason why we do this, or you might see this, is because obviously if a patient's got their cuff down, um, we're essentially introducing a really big leak into the system, which in an invasive mode really doesn't like, and it will alarm at us and tell us that we're not achieving our pressures and we're not achieving our tidal volume. Um, so in order to sort of keep the ventilator happy and keep everybody sane, we swap them to the non-invasive mode because we know that this is a mode that recognises leak and it accepts leak because it's normally someone with a tight face mask on who will have an element of leak. Um, and we're essentially delivering... Um, PEEP and pressure support or just PEEP to them, which is exactly the same as what, for example, pressure support CPAP would do in the vent in the invasive mode. It's essentially BiPAP. So we're still delivering the same principles of ventilation. The ventilator, we're almost tricking the ventilator a little bit um, and sort of popping them on it. Um, and yeah, the making the ventilator a bit happier really and keeping the nurses sane. So you, you might see it and you might think, why is this person on NIV when they've got a trachea in? Um, but it's, it's likely because they're potentially frequently going between having time with the cuff down and the cuff up. And we can leave them on this mode with the cuff up as well, because again, the principles of ventilation with it being a PEEP and a pressure support are exactly the same as them being on um, pressure support CPAP on the invasive mode, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and I think lastly, sort of looking at the screens, um, we can also run the CPAP HUD through the Mac A as well, um, which again, slightly confusing. You might look at the screen and it might look like the high flow screen. So with the flow in liters per minute is the um, top number and the FiO2 um, underneath. And what you might think is, oh, they're on high flow, but then you look at the patient and they're sat in a CPAP hood. So the CPAP hood on the Mac A is driven through high flow. And the PEEP is actually determined by the PEEP valve that's attached to the hood. So it's a little bit old school. So unlike the sort of non-invasive mode that we've just looked at, where you would change the PEEP by physically using your finger on the button, um, in order to, to manipulate and change the PEEP with the CPAP hood, you have to physically change the valve. And they come in five, seven and a half, 10 centimetres or 12 centimetres. So that's sort of old school but we're still you know we're still using that with this particular device and we just need to have the, the flow set to 60 which essentially is driving the flow and the oxygen through the hood 
and as they um as they're breathing out they're breathing out through the peep valve and that's what's creating the the resistance in the peep and there's a little jam jarry thing on the front of the hood which has got like the little nib on which you pull to sort of create that sort of um it keeps the hood inflated is it like a vacuum effect is that the right word yeah and then yeah you can pull the little nib out and it sort of keeps it inflated um the only sort of the only thing about the CPAP hood or the couple of things are you can't really run the humidification like you would be able to do through a non-invasive face mask um because it will just steam up and your patient will be in a sauna um and secondly unlike the sort of the the face mask if you were sort of doing face mask the CPAP through a face mask if your patient potentially needed to um have some inspiratory pressure introduced so some pressure support whether it be um because they were going into type 2 respiratory failure and their CO2 was going up or um potentially to rest them from a worker breathing point of view you would be able to add pressure support if they're on the mask CPAP but with the hood there is no option to do that um because it, it is literally just the peep valve you can't introduce an inspiratory pressure so they are a one-time wonder for CPAP only. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to talk about some of the functions that are relevant to us um, in terms of the screen and some of the buttons that we need to be aware of. And then we'll perhaps have a, a minute to answer any questions. We with uh, that's the whistle stop tour of modes of ventilation um, complete so if you've got some questions once we've uh, looked at these pictures of the screen then we'll we'll cover those before we just talk about some alternative methods of ventilation so um we often find that the alarms are going off so this um top left hand side we've got the alarm um countdown there when it goes off and that button will silence it so then so that's it in silence and it will it will silence it for two minutes and um you know that counts down to tell you um how long it before the alarms are back on again um the reason for it alarming will be along this top bar here so it's rather than just blindly pressing the alarm silence button we do need to be aware of why we're silencing it and if something else then causes the the alarm to go off you've silenced it so that wouldn't be happening but you'll get that reason sort of flashing up there so we just need to keep an eye on that i think we've already mentioned the standby button but that that's just um below the alarm silence button on the left um we'd use that if we were putting um if we wanted to swap the patient uh, um onto the cough assist for example for, to do some treatment or if we were disconnecting from the vent to do some hand, manual hyperinflation rather than allowing um the, the ventilator just to be ventilating the air around us, um, particularly um, since COVID, we, we shouldn't be allowing that to happen. We can just press standby. It's, it feels a bit scary pressing standby on a ventilator, um, but it's incredibly quick to um, switch back on, which I'll show you in a minute. And another button we like is the O2 boost button. So on the bottom left hand corner, um, this is it in um, in use. Um, it'll say O2 boost. It gives 100% um, oxygen for two minutes. It also silences your alarm for uh, for one minute as well. So you just need to be aware that um, any sort of reasons for the um, vent to be alarming, you're not going to be necessarily aware of unless you're looking. So you would just press and hold, and a little green um, bar comes along here under this X um, as it as it delivers it and then it'll it'll be counting down as to how long you've got before you go back in you go back to your baseline FiO2. Um, just a slide about switching to standby. So as I said, we use this if we're disconnecting the patient from the ventilator for any reason. So putting a passive muir valve in um, uh, um, clear away, manual hyperinflation. Um, uh, you may need to pre-oxygenate your patient before you disconnect them. So you could use that O2 boost button first. Um, you, you may not need to. You press standby and then you get this screen on the right where it's back in its standby screen like we showed you at the beginning. And as we said before, you just press start ventilation or start on the left hand side and it just goes back into the settings that um, it, that were previously set. And it shows you them sort of greyed out here. These are obviously different screens, so they are they are different. Um, but you 
you're literally starting and stopping um, without having to change anything. Slightly different if you're going into change modes, if you were swapping somebody to um, back into invasive from non-invasive when the when when you're taking a passing mirror valve out and putting the cuff back up, um, you know, which we can go through if people want to come and shadow or anything like that. Um, but yeah, just switching on and off to disconnect is um, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute and if anyone wants to ask any questions then go ahead you can pop something in the chat or just shout out or put your hand up or whatever if everyone's happy then I'll just carry on so Kia are there any specific examples of when volume control or pressure control would be preferred over PRVC? Um, depends on the person setting it up, perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose um, if they want it, or it, yeah, it, so you said there, is it more for a weaning patient? Um, I remember years ago an anaesthetist describing it as the um, lazy person's mode because it it does allow that patient to to wean to some extent. So, grad, you know, they're they're sort of self weaning the amount of support they might need. Whereas when if you've got them on pressure on a pressure control mode, um, you it, you're instigating weaning that, and and you might not do that as quickly as the patient would mm -hmm. be able to do. Um, if they want to keep things very specific. When you've got perhaps somebody paralysed, um, then they would go for those most basic modes, um, uh, volume control or pressure control. Um, they are similar, aren't they? They're and they, yeah, they're, they are quite similar. But there's there's probably to some degree an element of the preference of. I think the it's, I think it's mostly preference. Yeah, um, I think probably it's. Yeah, preference of the anaesthetist, but I do think that mostly they are putting patients, even if they're sedated and paralysed, often on SI and BPRVC, because yeah. I think that's the one that most people are familiar with. Um, I mean, essentially, the principles of them are all very, very similar. Yeah. Um, there's almost too many. It's, yeah, it's there, yeah, yeah the kind of is that it. it's, it's subtle differences. Is that OK, kid? Does that clear that up? Because volume control and pressure control, the combination of the two is PRVC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'll go back to sharing. Um, yes, <laughs> me the, too. The, um, that, the PowerPoint just for the last few slides. So some of the other ventilation strategies which we've touched upon um, just in case you're seeing slightly different things and thinking what is going on here. Um, so something called protective lung ventilation. Um, this came about from a study back in 2000 with the ARDSNET study, which suggested that a significant change um, in ventilation, our traditional ventilation was needed for patients with ARDS due to the, co the compliance of their lungs. And this, these findings have been supported by the subsequent more recent studies. And, and it's the general principles of what, are still widely accepted really. So the, the principles around protective lung ventilation is about limiting the tidal volume so that we're not over inflating patients. So this is where, you know, if you've got an ARDS patient, this is where you might want to pay particular attention to that, um, that right-hand side um, parameter of the um, tidal volume for what predicted body weight. And we're, we're looking at the lower, the lower end there of more like around the six, not up to the 10. Um, we're using higher levels of PEEP, um, uh, trying to protect from, uh, prevent any um, atelectra trauma, so um, sort of pressure trauma, but we, we're keeping the plateau pressure below uh, 30, so it's, it's about the sort of change in pressure um, uh, and the, the ability of the, the lungs to deal with that if the compliance isn't as good. And what that means is that we're often accepting higher than normal carbon um, PCO2s. So as long as the pH isn't um, 
wildly out and sort of you know dangerously low um we might allow that patient to to have higher levels of co2 so that we're not overstretching their lungs and sort of causing longer term damage Something else I think that we I don't feel like I've seen very much for a while is an inverse ratio of ventilation. So this is where we reverse the, the ratio of the inspiratory to expiratory phase of ventilation um, so that we deliver the breath for um, a, a proportionally longer time over that each breath. Um, so um, we've got a, a two to one ratio. So our inspiratory phase is uh, twice as long as our expiratory phase. Um, this means that we've got, um, potentially we're, we're reaching more alve alveoli um, because we've got longer to, to ventilate them. So we can hopefully improve oxygenation by um, recruiting more alveoli. But I, I don't know if you feel like you've seen it very much. Not particularly. No, really, I don't no. feel like it. I've seen it for a while. And um, lastly, not so much a ventilator um, strategy, but um, something that goes alongside ventilation um, is prone positioning. I feel like um, I sort of potentially don't need to talk about this quite as much as we might have done previously. I feel like we've talked about prone a lot over the last couple of years. Um, so Prone positioning can improve oxygenation because we're improving the VQ matching. So at the beginning, we've talked about how um, we create a mismatch of VQ when we ventilate somebody with positive pressure. When we've got somebody with ARDS or now COVID-19, if we put them in the prone position, we can hopefully get more homogenous ventilation. So we're ventilating um, more throughout the lung for, you know, um, in a sort of AP di direction, we're, but we distribute it, we get a better do dorsal distribution. So if you think about that line of least resistance, if the patient is lying on their front, we can ventilate the bases and the posterior aspects of, of the lung more easily. Um, we're also, we've probably got more homogenous perfusion, so that's sort of more even throughout the lungs rather than being dependent on gravity. Um, and we, we can improve lung volumes because because um, we're, we're unloading the diaphragm, we're, by changing the position, the diaphragm isn't, uh, we're not, the ventilation doesn't have to push the diaphragm out of the way in the way that it would do if the patient was supine or how we typically find people in a sort of slumped position where they're kind of bent up a little bit and, and their diaphragm is perhaps hindering things. So the combination of those things can improve um, our VQ matching and improve oxygenation. We've talked more in detail about prone positioning when we've talked about COVID-19. So um, if it's something you want to look at in a bit more detail, it might be worth looking back at the um, COVID presentation we did um, a while ago now. Or um, if you're coming to shadow um, at some point, come and have a chat with us about it. Um, perhaps if you are seeing any COVID patients, um, you, you might have an opportunity to see somebody in prone. The last slide I've got here is um, something called the a one pager. So this website website onepagericu.com is really good for all sorts of one pages like this, which just gives you a really quick overview of something. They've got absolutely everything, um, including things that we probably don't even need to think about. Um, related to ICU, but there's lots around sort of ventilation arterial blood gases, um, all sorts of things. This just gives you a really nice overview of the, um, sort of broadly of the um, ventilator modes that we've talked about, a brief description. So the pros and cons around um, uh, those um, ventilator strategies. And then a, a nice column on the end that talks about the um, major settings and how you might alter things if you were trying to manipulate ventilation. Um, so, for example, in the volume control modes, um, if the ventilation, um, if, if you wanted to increase the pH, then you would increase the parameters that are in green, so the respiratory rate or the tidal volume. Um, so it's worth just having a, a bit of a look at. And if you're wanting to have a really quick recap at some point, um, take a look at it. Um, you can go to that website to 
little bit find. American. Obviously, yes, obviously, they are. Yeah, they are American. So some of them, um, I think, in fact, like the blood gases one mm -hmm. will all be yeah. um, different um, parameters to what we're used to. So some, yeah, there's a few of them that aren't particularly useful for us, but um, this one in particular I think broadly was quite speaking, nice. They can use a lot of the same yeah. information. Yeah. Um, 